I am the new associate head coach at Eastern Illinois University. I began this, uh, this project of Bully Junkies around two and a half months ago uh, when I wanted to start it, um, an educational project uh, that we will learn from people all around the world by listening to their backgrounds and experiences. Um, here we are today um, around maybe 60 guests uh, you know, after, and uh, we continue to uh, be able to bring guests that continue to challenge us and bring us uh, you know, new learning uh, opportunities for everyone that is watching around the world. So I appreciate the support that everyone has uh, provided me with, um, everyone has provided to Volley Junkies. I encourage everyone to follow and like uh, the Volley Junkies page where you can find this and the past videos uh, that we have uh, recorded so far. I reminded you that a week from today, we're gonna have Bernardino on. Um, so it's probably gonna be you know, one of the biggest events that we have had so far. Uh, but today, it's a very special program as well. We have the current national champion in the NCAA Division I, the number one university league in the world, Mr. Kevin Hambly. How are you, Kevin? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Um, how's everything going for you, your family, and your team throughout this hard time, Kevin? Yeah, I think uh, like everybody else, we're just being uh, – we're homeschooling our kids and spend a lot of time together. And um, I think the thing that's the hardest is that my team's just anxious to get back on the court and we don't know, we have no idea when that's going to happen, you know? And so I think if we had a date that we could all shoot for and we knew, um, we're going to get back together, then maybe some of their anxiety would lessen. But right now, because of, um, just because of the situation we're in, there's a lot, there's a lot of high anxiety, young women ready to come back and get to work and trying to work out in their backyards with their dads or moms and sisters and brothers or whatever, which is, you know, it's not the same. They just, they're just really looking forward to get together. And honestly, like I, I really enjoyed this time with my family and my kids. And if I could coach my team, then life would be great. But uh, we, we don't have that opportunity just yet. What are things that you have learned about yourself throughout these hard times, Kevin? Right? Now that you have some time to look back, uh, by the way, so much success uh, has followed you, whatever you have been. Um, are you able to now take that back and think about, you know, the good times that you have had so far and also – some great learning opportunities? Um, no, I haven't thought about that at all, to be honest. Like, I mean, I think I'm always, I think about the things I learn. I think about the mistakes I've made. I think about um, how I can be better. And what's been nice about this time is I've been able to watch a lot of video. The bummer is there's nothing yeah. new coming out, but I've been able to go back and watch a lot of video of our team. And I've been able to watch a lot of um, high level men's and women's international play and just see what I could take from it, from our team moving forward. But I'm not really, well, I think the thing, to answer your question, the thing I learned most is like, I have to be actively working. I can't, I, I can't just have any moment of rest. Like my wife will say, <laughs> will tell you that if I'm not like, if I don't have a project, if I'm not working on something, then I'm miserable to be around. And so <laughs> I, I, this, the idea, like what I've been focusing on now is trying to help, you know, the NCAA and help the conference get back on track and for us to get like, what, what do we need to do and how do we need to schedule and all that? That's been kind of the project. And then Trying to trying to be better about coaching and learn and um, watch as many of these videos as I can watch as much video as I can on uh, just watching teams play and seeing the innovations of the game and the direction it's going and um, and so I, I uh, I've been busy and I need to be busy or I'll lose my mind. Take me back to the nineties. What were you doing then, uh, Kevin? How was Kevin Hambly at that point? In the nineties, well, uh, well. I was an angry volleyball player trying to prove myself. I think is probably the best way. Like I play with a chip and angry and um, I was pretty intense and probably not. I think I was a supportive teammate, but I, I was, I'd get on guys a lot. 
I would yell you at guys a lot. I was talking, Kevin, what you're saying right now. You know, looking at yeah. your you sidelines and then, you know, you're talking about the type of player that you were. Yeah, no, I was the opposite as a as a player. I, mean, I was super competitive and I think that's how I at that time that's how I personify um competitiveness when you're young. You don't know like that's how you show it, right? That's how you that's how you put it out there is like by being a yeller and a screamer and and like tearing my shirt and beating my chest and kicking balls and all that stuff. And um, turns out it doesn't work very well as a coach to do that to your players and be that way. At least it hasn't worked well for me. Um, so instead I'm just like quiet and sarcastic, but I was, you know, I was a guy trying to make it in the volleyball world, trying had aspirations of playing in the, in the Olympics and I got in the USA gym, but I just wasn't good enough. And so uh, I played a little bit of professional and, Looked at playing prof- I played one year professional, looked at playing another year, kind of got some extended tryout stuff, but um, decided even in the 90s, I started coaching in 96, you know, midway through the 90s that uh, I was better off being a coach. I wanted to start to try to understand what coaching was. Kevin, when I was a player and I was not as good as you were, um, I, was not, I wasn't thinking that my goal was going to be a coach. You know, it never crossed my mind. I had a different, completely different plan in my mind. Do you know as a player already that that's the path that you wanted to follow? Yeah, it was one of the things I wanted to look at. I think um, I went to, to BYU and um, they have a really they have a pretty good theater and film school up there. And I was thinking about doing movies and not acting, but like behind the camera stuff and directing and all that. And uh, I thought that was interesting. I like the idea of like having a telling story. I like the idea of creating a vision, sharing a vision, like all that stuff. And I, that was interesting to me. I, I like to write. And then, um, but I, in the back of my mind, I was, I, I coached a little basketball team, a little junior high basketball team when I was in high school. And I just loved coaching that team. Uh, I just, I mean, I loved it. It was so much fun. And we actually lost our center. And so we had to be creative and like our best player was our center. We had to be creative and like figure out a new style to play. And it actually looked more like what it looks like now where everything's spread out, middle of the core is wide open. We're shooting a lot of threes. Um, and we just had a problem to solve. And I just loved the, uh, interaction with the guys. I loved the problem solving. I loved like seeing everyone kind of improve and move forward in junior high men's boys basketball. There's a lot of improvement. There's a lot of reward there. A little bit different than, you know, like high level professional, but, um, <laughs> but I just, I just really love that. So in the back of my mind, and one of the reasons I chose to go to BYU was to play for Carl McGowan. Um, Cause I knew he was a great coach and he would be a good role model for me as a coach. And he was absolutely, obviously by all the coaches that have come out of his gym you know i think there's a ton of coaches that have come out i mean i know there's a ton of coaches that come mm-hmm. out of the gym so um it was um, in my mind but i wouldn't say it was on the forefront of my mind when i entered college ozzy antonetti and chris mcgown had told me that those first year with carl he would probably he used you guys mostly you know in a good way as guinea pigs to what came you know to be this monster philosophy yeah. around viral you know gms um can you tell me a little bit about that experimentation process? You know, what were some things that when you got there, you were like, wait, why are we doing things the way that we're doing right now? And then well, yeah. they started making sense. Well, I would say, actually, Carl was a great teacher always. He was a great mm-hmm. teacher. And he was a, he was great at um, sharing that, what he, like articulating his vision for what needed to happen. He was, he was incredible in the gym. Honestly, I believe I would do, if he told me to do a cartwheel and then hit and that would make me better, I would have done it. But he wasn't, and he has told me this. So I love Carl. I would not have chosen to play for anybody else uh, ever. Mm-hmm. And But he wasn't a great coach. He was a great teacher. And I think he mm-hmm. didn't understand, um, like people would say now, I mean, people would say that he was a little bit, um, he didn't understand the guys really. He didn't really like care about the emotions of guys and the team. And like, I remember like, I was screaming at him, like cussing him out in practice because what he was saying to me. And, and and he's just like grabbing the pole and he got so excited. He's like, I love this. And I was just like, you are sick. Like you are a sick man. Like you shouldn't <laughs> love any bit of this. Like we're literally screaming at each other. He's like, I love this, Kevin. I love this. And I'm just like, because uh, he was, he, he knew how to, he pushed my buttons. Like it worked for me because I was intense and he was intense and we would battle. We'd, we'd yell at each other a lot. And he liked that. And, um, I don't, I don't know that I liked it, but it worked for whatever. And he knew, it kind of pushed my buttons. But I think I know he evolved, just like we all have as coaches. I'm a much mm-hmm. different coach than I was in 96 to now. And he evolved. And I you know I went back and I've watched him coach a lot after that. And he's, he was one of the best you know, at the end. It's really cool. It's really inspiring to me to see a, 
a man who was at that point, late fifties, probably still working yeah. to be better and trying to be a better coach. And, you know, I hope to be on that same trajectory. I mean, I know I'm not, like I said, I'm not, I'm not, maybe this is why, because I'm not, I just want to get better. I want to keep moving in the right direction. And I want to keep asking the right questions of myself. Like, how can I be better? And what did I screw up? And, you know, what, you know, what are the things that I should be looking at and be honest about to make, to be a better coach moving forward so I can be better for the athletes. Do you ask a lot of questions at that point as an athlete or do you discover, you know, do you become a better learner later as a coach? Um, you know, tell me a little bit about that, about that process. Well, I think it, there was an evolution there, right? So when I first was a, f a high school player and then a freshman, um, sophomore maybe even, I didn't ask any questions. I just did what the coaches asked. But as I started to understand the game a little bit more and I started to kind of develop my own opinions about the game, then I started to ask why a little bit, like when things wouldn't make sense. You know, if things were said that made sense, then I'd go, yeah, this, I got this. Like this, I, this makes sense to me. I'm, I'll work on that. I'm glad you brought that to me. But if things didn't make sense, then I'd be kind of like, why are we doing this, Carl? This doesn't make sense to me, you know? And, and then, and sometimes he was patient enough to answer that. And sometimes he wasn't, you know, and um, the times when he was like, I think then if I agreed with him, then, and, or if I understood then I would just go for it a hundred percent. But the things I didn't understand, I think I kind of had one foot out the door all the time on it and I would abandon it. And so, I mean, what I learned from that is that I encourage those questions as a coach. Like I want the why. Because I was, mm -hmm. I was, I was analyzing the game too when I was a player, just like a lot of the guys we were. I mean, we had really good conversations. I mean, I played with Hugh McCutcheon and Jason Watson and Sean Patchell, and uh, I mean, Steve Hyatt is one of the smartest volleyball guys I've been around, and Scott Larkin, like all these guys. That, amazing people, yeah. Amazing, but also most of them, all of them are coaches now. You know, yeah. And we we're all analyzing mm -hmm. the game, and and I think we had great conversations about the game, and and so I think all of us. Um, just we're inquisitive about how do we be better? And we were all searching for that. And so, um, you know, if Carl wasn't answering those things and we kind of had our own answers, you know, and I think at that point um, he wasn't, he didn't have the patience sometimes for that, where that changed mm -hmm. later on. And for me, I just, I learned from that. Like I want to have, I want my team to ask why. In fact, I try to get ahead of it. When I present a new idea or a new system or a new wrinkle, I'm always saying, Hey, here's why. And here's when we're going to use this. And here, try to lay it all out, let them ask questions. And, um, it's really, I think it's helped them kind of understand what we want to do. And then they just move forward. It's been great for me. Being in the, being in the gym, you know, in the USA gym and you not being the best player, as you mentioned there. Um, did that well, let's be, let's be clear. I was on the fringe of like, I was the worst player in the gym. Probably when I was there. <laughs> so just, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Did, did that teach you any lessons about, how to treat your last player in any team that you started coaching after that? Yeah, I, well, I think, um, you know, I, I, as a, as a football player, basketball player, baseball player, I mean, I played all these sports growing up. I had been the star on teams and I had not been the star on teams. And I think the thing that I, you know, you, as an athlete, the thing that I always wanted is I wanted to bring value to the team. You know, I always wanted to, like make the group better, you know? And so like when I was a sophomore basketball player playing with the varsity, you know, like, and I would, I'd get my 15 to 20 minutes or whatever in those games, I would, um, the rest of the time I'd be trying to like help guys out and talk about stuff. And, and then in practice, I would try to make the, the starting side better, you know? And so, mm -hmm. and then, and then like, I, I mean, I even remember, I remember like when I was a starter and like as a basketball player and as a, as a volleyball player, like, I wanted, I, I would be on the guys on the other side of the court to make us better, you know, because I wanted them to be better. And so I think I always understood, like, for whatever reason, that we're all in this together and all of our roles are important. That Because I, maybe because I played both sides, even as a young athlete. And so now as a coach, you know, like we try to make sure that everyone on our team has a role. And even though the role might not have anything to do with being on the floor, it could have uh -huh. something to do with helping the players that are on the floor. And if you have time for like one little story, like I'll tell you my favorite moment as a coach, one of my favorite moments as a coach. Please do. That's cool. Please yeah. Do. My 2011 team, which we had a pretty good team, and I think at this time um, we were we were undefeated. We went to the championship game that year, but we had a really good culture, and the culture was where you'd want a group. Like everyone had their role, and everyone was kind of dialed in. And um, I remember we were we called it, we were down, we were calling a timeout, and we had a player, uh, Jessica Gendrick, who was our third middle, and Jessica Gendrick never played that year, like not one time. I mean, early on, but like not in any kind of meaningful moments. 
and Aaron Johnson, who's now the assistant coach at UC Irvine, actually, Bullet Men's, which is really cool. <laughs> but she comes uh-huh. off and, and walks up to Jess and goes, and goes, Jess, what are you, what are you seeing out there? Because we're down, right? We're struggling. And she's looking to Jess. And typically what happens in our timeouts is the, the positions meet. If you watch our, our huddles, like positions will meet uh-huh. or the passers will meet or the centers will meet with the middles. Or like there'll be um, things going on like amongst our players sharing information from the bench to the, to the court. And then we're talking as a staff about what we, what we see. And then we all come together and we talk about it. So I, I catch this little thing like Aaron or Aaron asking Jess, like what's going on. And Jess, like, I got nothing. Like I wasn't paying attention. And Aaron, here's my starter turns to the player on the bench and goes, Hey, Jess, like I rely on you for that information. I need to know what shots open. I need to know if there's scenes. And Jess is like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And like, so for, for me, that moment was the, like just one of the coolest because, well, first off, I had nothing to do with it. Like I'm just observing, mm-hmm. it, which is a great thing mm-hmm. for a culture, right? The culture is yeah. like, that means your culture strong. The, the athletes are preserving this. Secondly, they are like here a starter is telling a player that is never going to see the court. I need you in the match. And then, mm-hmm. so from then on out, Jess was on it, of course. And they were amazing. It was amazing. And was like an amazing communicator with that, with the players that are on the, on the court and felt valued. And then everyone, because they all heard that as a, as a athlete that wasn't on the floor, which no one wants to be off the floor. Right. But they, mm-hmm. they felt valued with the rest of the group. And that was one of my favorite moments. So sorry to, to kind of take it that direction, but I just love that moment. And the beauty of this program, Kevin, is that you can take it whatatever you want. We have okay. no time limit and okay. people will love to hear your insights and stories okay. about it, uh, things like that. So, Cool. Don't worry about it. I, we actually love that. Um, how do you create that selfless culture, hey, Kevin? Like, is, is there, you know, what's your formula, basically? Not like the universal formula, but what do you think are essentials in that well, type of culture? Yeah, I think first and foremost, like I, as, as a coaching staff, we have to value all the roles the same. Like, we yeah. have to present it that way. Because I think if we dismiss the bench or we dismiss the players that aren't playing and don't value their input, and don't talk about that amongst the group, and and then talk to them about their value. Um, then the, ben- the the players on the court aren't going to value it. So it it starts there. But then you have to create a culture where people trust enough that they can be honest with each other, really honest with each other, and which is really hard to create because it could it's so fragile, it's so fragile, and it can and it's fleeting if you screw it up, right? So w- w- the things that we talk a lot about. What were you saying? Getting out of that, yeah, getting that, getting out of the artificial harmony is the hardest point, right? Yes, I think it's. I mean, it, and we you have to call it out when you see it, and you have to like find ways to kind of get through that. And so we talk about it a lot, and um, it's one of the things that I, I mean, trust is the most important thing amongst teams, and from teams to coaches and coaches to players, like all that. I think without a doubt, that's the most important thing at every level. And so for us, like really creating a level of trust and that. And, and so that you can, you can communicate freely. And I think the, the receiving part of it is the most important part of that. Like it's sometimes pe- people will test that, right? If you say this is what we want, athletes will test it. They'll try it. They'll go, okay, you're telling me you want this. Maybe you've told me like, I've heard this 10 times. So now I'm going to try it. And as receivers, we have to be very good about receiving that or it goes away quickly or, or no one. If we, if we, um, if we attack them, if we laugh at them, if we, mock them, if there's any level of judgment in that, then we, we lose it pretty quick, especially with my age group that I'm coaching from 18 to 22 year old women who are really strong, but they still are very careful about trusting people. Everyone is trust, careful about trusting people. And especially when you're in a competitive gym and everyone's fighting for opportunities to play. I think like the, I think the most important thing is like as a group, creating a culture where, and as a coach, not allowing anyone to judge, um, the comments that are being made by anybody as a, when you're the receivers, I think that's, that's the part that is, um, that's the biggest part of communication to me is like listening and making sure that you're not judging. Do you reinforce that with catching them doing it right more than wrong? Kevin? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, both like both, if it's wrong, you got to call it out fast. and like, I'm not going to tolerate this. Like, I think I jump on that. Like I would, you know, like, my like my little my dog if he's going to chew on the rug you know it's like no stop that you know like you can't do that because you just can't allow that you can't you can't let that go you have to stop that immediately because you want that person to be free but when people are 
not moving like the opera operating with judgment. I just, I say it all the time when our, I think our culture was really good last year and it was, I'd say, you know, like, Hey, uh, this is, this is really special. The way that you guys are treating each other, the way that we're communicating, like you guys didn't agree, but you did it respectfully and that's how it should work. And then you didn't judge that person for something you didn't agree with. And, you know, just, I just think it's, it's something you have, that's something you could lose it in one second, but to build it, it takes a whole season maybe to really get it where you want it to be. Do you coach everyone fairly or equal? Well, I don't coach everyone the same, if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. I I tell them a lot my, their freshman year, that which is their you know their first year playing for us, is that the, the rooks like you guys are gonna you're gonna te you're gonna teach me how you need to be coached basically. I'm gonna try some mm -hmm. stuff and see because I haven't coached you yet, and I'm gonna pay attention. And then what works for you is how I'm gonna work with you, you know. And so just be who you are and be honest and like, let's talk about it. And I'll ask them like, Hey, does that work for you? Like this kind of communication, do you need more video? Like we just start kind of working through that. And then, so I just, I guess that's fairly because, um, you know, I'm, I'm relying on them to communicate with me about how that, what works for them. And then uh, equally that, I mean, I don't know if it's equal because some players really want to be left alone until they're, um, you know, do something great or they're just grinding things out. And some players need a lot more feedback. And so I try to I try to um, do what works best for each player. So I'm not sure that I answered it directly, but that's kind of how we operate. Mm -hmm. Coaching your best player, like Michelle Barch, Plummer, uh, or you know, I don't want to say say best player. I'm going to say my favorite players on your team, you know, from the crowd. So um, coaching, you know, some of those players. Um, what's the key in order to send the right message to everyone else in your team, coach? Well, I think we're gonna ever we're gonna teach all of them, right? So I think if you come in our gym, we're gonna be looking for opportunities in practice to teach. We're we're gonna start out practice with some ideas of things we want to work on, and then we're gonna you know focus on those things. But the, everyone in our gym is gonna be taught. Like everyone's, they're all treated the same as far as the level of or the fact that we're committed to teaching them. So I, I think like, yeah, Plummer might have been ahead of let's say I have a redshirt, a really talented redshirt freshman, Katie Baird as a player, like there might be a pretty good um, gap there. So the things I'm teaching them might not be the same, but I'm teaching them equally as much and looking for the same opportunity, teaching opportunities to, to, to work with them and try to help them be the best players they can be. And so, uh, I mean, I think everyone's treated the same that way in our gym. So I'm not sure that answers your question, but I, I think with, like, mm -hmm. I just, I treat them like, and if they, if they're not going for a ball, they're chasing balls. You know, if they're not going, if they're not working hard, we're calling it out. Like everyone's the same. And that way, they're all held to the same standard of effort. Um, and then, what's what I've when I've my teams have been really good. The, my best teams, my best players, have been most excited about the learning opportunities and have been eager to learn. And then that helps your whole team, like you know, want to go. The ones that have struggled is when your top player is lazy. Then you know you got a problem there because everyone is looking to see how that person responds. And you know, I think I had three best players last year. You know, I think. My three All-Americans were really special with oh, yeah. Gray. Oh, yeah. With Gray, I don't know who was a better center last year. I would not have traded Gray, him. Gray, um, Yeah, Plummer. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, and then Morgan Hentz. Is, Hentz is ridiculous. And so all of them, but all of them were really wanted to be better players. And all of them made big improvements in their careers, which is, you know, so the whole team followed. I'm not going to – I've had some teams where that hasn't been the case, where players were lazy. And um, we had a hard time getting the team moving forward. Do your best players always play? Or have you had teams where they're not your best workers and then you have to make some hard decisions based on that? Yeah, I would say that's probably – maybe I, have, I, have, I haven't I have had enough depth on my teams to bench my best player. And it's not fair. I mean, in some ways, you don't want to lose matches uh, – I don't want to lose matches to, to teach a lesson necessarily. It's not fair to the other players. I just try to work with mm -hmm. those players to, to, to be better and work harder and, and figure out what the work ethic is to be a leader. And we talk about that. I kind of address it that way. I mean, I, I don't know if you had Michelle Barch on this. I don't think, have you had her on here? But if you talk I to her, not, she's a great player. Of course, yes. But she, yes. she was not, when she was a freshman, sophomore, she had a work ethic issue. And, we she heard it she heard it a lot from me now it just was more about defining what hard work is for her and she got better and better and 
And by the end, she was an amazing example. But it started out that way, where she was probably our most talented player, but wasn't working as hard as I had a kid named Laura Brewer at that point, who was a great leader and a great competitor and an extremely hard worker. And so Michelle, it took her a while to kind of catch that work ethic with, uh, with Laura, and which is really what you want your, for me, your upperclassmen and your veterans to pass down is that work ethic and the culture and the, and the, and the openness to learning. Like that's the stuff that we really want them to pass down. And most freshmen don't come out of that. Don't come into our world with that kind of attitude unless they've been in some really remarkable club programs, which is, you know, it's pretty rare that they get that opportunity. Do you, cause there are like really good club programs, um, you know, in the U S that, uh, they're mostly, for example, block, um, or, you know, or, or players necessarily know how to learn. Do you have to deal with that at the level that you're coaching right now, where you have to teach players how to learn? Kevin, um, is this happening at your level? Yeah, I would say a hundred percent. I would say that's the, the freshman year, mostly like they get players get better and they, they, they learn and they, um, they're making improvements in their skills and all that. But I would say that first year that we get them, they're learning how to learn and we're learning how to teach them. And that's what that first year is really about. And in the fall, we're figuring some stuff out, but really in the spring is when we really make our gains together. And then, you know, they get better, but I, I'd say where we see the most improvement is in that once we've learned that is that sophomore year, fall, sophomore year, spring is when you see players really take off. At least in our gym, that's how it's been. Because then they, they've really figured out how to learn. They figured out like, what growth mindset, everyone talks about growth mindset, you know, what a growth mindset is and like that you have to actually make a lot of mistakes to have a growth mindset and you have to screw up and you have to be okay with that and you have to do it without judgment. And it it's really hard for them because they're not used to failing ever. And so um, I think for us, like it takes a while for them to be really understand what that is and to be comfortable with that. I, I can't say I've ever had a freshman that's come in with that mentality. I certainly have come with freshmen that have bought into it sooner and have figured it out earlier, but I haven't, I wouldn't say that I had a lot that came in with just that mentality right off the bat. Is that, being, your recruiting? Is that part of your recruiting, Kevin? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. I was, I was going to say freshman rookies, you know, I know that not everyone here understands the NCAA or our terminology, but so that's all I was going to say. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Manolo. Okay. No, that's okay. Um, is that, is that part of, uh, you know, of, of what you do in terms of um, uh, of the process they go through in your program um, as learners? Like, do, they, do, do you talk about the concept of the growth mindset since day one? And by the way, Trevor Regan is going to be in our program, Molly Junkies, on Monday. So we're excited to talk about that specific concept. But how do you approach failure with, with your players? Well, we talk about growth mindset, but I don't know. We use that terminology anymore. I feel like that terminology has been just butchered and turned into something else. We, you know, I, I think uh, we talk about just um, pushing yourself to failure, you know, like as much as you can and trying things and being open to that and doing it without judging yourself first, because no one's going to judge you in this gym. And that's, again, goes back to that trust piece, right. And the lack of judgment and, and trying to, trying to make them and comfortable with making mistakes because they all come in and want to hit to six, like all the outsides want to come in and just hit the six because it's safe, hit high flat to six, high flat to six. And it's like, no, I don't. We want to see you make these mistakes. Go down the line, like tool, work on the shot. If you, and then when they make mistakes that are about learning, I celebrate those as more probably than when they bounce a ball in the seam. Actually, I don't know that I ever celebrate a ball bouncing the seam. I celebrate them like, like, Hey, I'm more ahead this high flat line shot. I'm going for the outside hand. I missed. And I'll celebrate that. Like, Yes, keep going. Keep working on that. You're going to find that. Like, you're so close. Just keep going for it. And that's that's the stuff that will celebrate more. And so I think, do we talk about it? Yes. But, like, what's more important is that that as coaches, we're thinking that way all the time and trying to keep our players thinking that way all the time and that we are reinforcing the right behaviors in our gym that lead them down that path of having what people term a growth mindset. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. It makes it makes total sense and just come to my mind, you know, I was there in your final game last season and you know, the perfect example of that is lost play, you know, maybe a neg negative to exclamation type of uh, pass or situation. Uh, Plummer is on rotation one, she's eating from zone two, she's getting set by Morgan Hens, 
an out of system ball, high ball, almost to the ceiling, and she hits Ryan. Yeah. You know, with a ball coming from deep zone five. Such yeah. a difficult shot, but it requires for you know, it requires the player to feel that the coaches trust that that type of risk could be taken in your team. Well, yeah, I mean, and she worked hard on that shot to be able to like she put the time in so she, so she hey. could trust herself in the moment. Like that's the thing is if you're not if you don't have if you're not working on growing, right? If you're not making that mistake over and over and over again until you can have enough trust in yourself to do it, you're going to fail. But my favorite swing is actually in that match was an error, Megan McClure. So we talk all the time, and I heard Sheffield on this talk about like this, creating swings and creating swings on plays that are off the net. That's something we talk about a lot and that we work on a lot. And if you, you ask me if I had passions about things, I would say that probably is the one thing that I'm pretty passionate about is we need to create swings. But there's a swing in this match towards the end where Megan McClure jumps up my little six foot outside behind the 10-foot mm -hmm. line on a high ball and rips it because we talk a lot about putting pressure on the opponent. And they were backed up. If she hit it over the net, we would have got an out-of-system ball back. And I just love that she approached to hit it that way, and she attacked it. And she hit it in the net, and she made a mistake. What's cool about that to me is that when Jenna Gray was interviewed after the we won the championship, they asked, what's the legacy you want to leave? And her comment was about that moment where – Megan went up and took a swing and was okay to fail. And she's like, that's what I hope the legacy we lead. It's okay to fail. It's okay to push. And it's okay to, to challenge yourself and make mistakes. And I was just like, man, that's this kid gets what we've been talking about the whole time. And not only that, but believes in it. And that part is, that was a really cool moment for me that Megan took the swing and was willing to put herself out there on the biggest stage that we're going to play in, in college athletics. And that my setter recognized that, 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 and commented that that moment is, what our culture should embody. Like, I loved all that, even though it was an error, but I just love what that meant because it's about having a real growth mindset. And, I, you know, and even when it was an error, it's like you said, you know, they're, they're trying to get better through those errors. They understand that failure is part of success. So when, you know, not just players, when, you know, when, when us, human beings, understand that failure gets you closer to that success as long as those mistakes, you know, continue to get better, um, I think that that's what, you know, create great learners out of, you know, out of everyone. And, you know, from the people that I have had here in this, you know, in Bali Junkies, um, I think some of the best learners have always expressed that, you know, what you're saying that, what you're saying right now, Kevin, that failure is such a big part of what we do every single day and understanding the value of it is, is really huge. Like, look at that shot, you know, like, <laughs> it's yeah. what we're talking about right now. No, but she see she's done that, like where she's at right there. This is not the set we want, but it's a. I mean, it's a ball that we can take a swing on, and she's hit that shot in our gym thousands of times. You know, because we're we're putting them in that situation all the time, and she's earned the trust to be able to hit that shot. I I agree. Like, Plummer has failed at that a lot. That shot right there. But in that moment, she put enough time in where she could trust herself to hit it. And I think the thing that's also cool is that if you asked, if you saw Megan now that same shot, that ball, the 10-foot line, she learned from that shot, and she's better because she took that shot. Like, if, in our gym, she's, like, and that that's the whole thing is, like, even in this match, even the match before this is probably a better example. We're talking about things that we need to continue to get better at. We need to continue, like, we're not done. This team wasn't done. This wasn't a finished product. The season just end, ended, and I love that concept, and I love that our group has bought into that. Like, they were constantly trying to get better and grow and add things to our game, and we were adding things the week of – um the final four um, because we, we thought we might need them, but also we just wanted to keep growing and getting better. So I just love, I just love that. I like that concept and it, I think it keeps your team interested too uh, in a long, long season moving forward. Coach, um, the past two seasons I have seen from your team, how daring and comfortable they are about not going much around the block. You are, you know, it seems like you're making an issue of, I want you to play against the block. I want you to play high with range. I want you yeah. to look for deeper zones. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because that's what we see from media. But what is, what is it that you work on? Um, and is this accurate? Yeah, it's 100% accurate. I mean, the easiest way to get kills is a tool down the line if you can get the swing there, you know. And it's one of the hardest balls to defend. Um, we, we, if you came in our gym, we're, we're first off, we're playing – out of system a lot 
and we're against a big block and we have a big block in our gym. And all we're talking about is how do we attack the block? Go down the line off the hands, go high flat to space. What defense are they in? Where do you know the, the spaces? If they're in rotation, where can you go? High flat to middle. If they're in middle, where can you go? High flat down the line, high flat to, to five. And just talking about that. And actually in the Minnesota match, if you watch that match, they they switched to a rotation on Megan McClure and she started going high flat to six, which, you know, most of the time you're telling your players not to do that, but that's because the communication from the bench and because she was working on that shot and she knew it was there for her. So I think like we're, we're talking about that. We're talking about like what hands to attack and like getting the last two fingers. And we just spend a ton of time in our gym working on it. So I'm glad it persona, like you see it when we're, when we're performing, but it's where we spend the most of our time attacking. How about, how about high sequence, especially on defense? Um, you know, you seem to provide a lot of freedom, of course, to, to hands, um, you know, yeah. where, she plays within your system, but then she mo she moves more than anyone else. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that freedom and how does she earn that? So for anyone that is coaching liberals out there, you know, what's the key to allowing the player to have that much freedom within a system? Yeah, so here's the deal I have with all of my players. First off, we when they come in, or if you the other the things we're going to work on a lot, like you're hitting on the things we talk about the most. So we, we work on eye sequence every day for at least a half hour against a live offense and a live block, like a live blocking situations and trying to read situations, trying to get better read setter, reading setters. Um, but, and then read hitters and put ourselves in the position, like in the front court, how do we want to line up the block and how do we want to try to block balls and in the back court, how do we want to play the seams and the angles and all that. But once we get that part down, I tell them all, like, if you see something, then I want you to, and, and you be, you believe you're going to, you can make a play on something, go make a play. So like our blockers, if they see the ball is being attacked out the line, as long as they get their hands outside the ball, I'm cool with it. Go get it. Go block it. In, <laughs> in that point now, like in it now, if you're on the, if you think you need to dive in into the scene big time, go dive in and leave line. If you see it, just make sure you see it. Don't guess if you see it. And the backcourt, same thing. If you see like a shot you think is going to be made and you, and you know it's going to happen, then go. So. Let me circle back to, to Morgan. Morgan sees things that I, no one else that I've been around has ever seen. And so I have allowed her more freedom than – well, no, everyone has the same level of freedom. She just makes more plays with that freedom than any player I've ever been around. The key is sometimes she's been off and she's missed and she hasn't seen. And what was hard for her is she was used to making these plays. And what where she got better is when she would guess sometimes. And I'd ask her, I'd be like, hey, did you see that? And she's like, I'm having a really hard time seeing and then it's like, well, that the deal is that if you can't see, just wait and and then react as opposed to trying to read. And uh, it took her a while to figure that out. But man, they that player, I watched her on video. I'll, I'll keep talking about Morgan here for a second. But I watched her on video, um, right before before I came in. I watched every match before I, as I was getting hired and going through this process. And we get in the gym the first day, and I wanted to just watch her before I started commenting on like making all these changes because she was really good. I just wanted to see what's going on. And we were working on, we were working on eye sequence and we got a, we had a ghost, like two hitter, we had a ghost slide mm -hmm. and the ball, we're trying to pick up tempo to, to um, plumber on the outside. So we're firing out a go and she's, you know, plumber loves to go four to four, especially like <laughs> hard, hard cross. And so we want Morgan to be there more than we want anyone else to be there. Right. But more, mm -hmm. and so we're working on that, but the block, the block is like a half step late. I'm watching the block's a half step late. And Morgan just sprints from right in front of me at the left sideline, you know, area five, to the dead middle of the court at the 10 foot line. And it's already and it's already kind of laying out before Plummer hits the ball. And as Plummer hits the ball, she hits it straight down in the middle of the court and she's right there and scoops it. And we run quick transitioning back on it. And so I was like, okay, like she has. This is this is this is a different kind of superpower than I've seen in collegiate volleyball. You know, like there's some pretty special. I've seen a lot of special international liberos, but we, I haven't been around anything like this uh, at the collegiate level. I have to figure out how to keep her inside our system so that people can work around her because that, that wasn't happening the year before. You know, it's there, people weren't working around. They just gave her a lot of space and then allow her that same kind of freedom to not. I don't want to take that away. Because that's that's amazing. I've never seen anything like that before. So I had to kind of sort through all that stuff. 
and a lot of it requires a lot of trust also from the players. So that also works with camaraderie inside of the of the group. So yeah. you know they understand the type of range that she can have. They feel more comfortable. If I'm a hitter by her side, and I have to pass or I have to dig, I know that I can feel really comfortable knowing that at least that seam, I don't have to worry much about it unless she tells me to. So I think that those are very special things that you're saying, Coach. And I want to I wanna bring up something very specific here. And I want people that are watching out there to watch the eye sequence of Plummer, who is number two on the opposite side of the camera. And I want you to watch number three, who is the middle, okay, for Stanford. I want you to watch that eye sequence. I want you to see how Plummer gets a glimpse to the hitter to understand spacing, to understand distance. And then after that, you know, very ball setter, ball, 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 and then hitter. So I want you to see this. Watch how she establishes herself here. A small crossover. Even though the middle was late, she took the right type of footwork with a cross step two coming from a long distance. She was in a dedicated format, fronting almost the opponent middle here. And watch that type of eye work. And then, you know, the defender, you know, playing middle, middle. And that, that's the other thing, Kevin, that I have seen that your team continues to get better, even when you're winning championships, is that the understanding of your players of power versus depth. So I can see them adapting to different hitters within the middle, middle area, but then going farther when they know the type of power that a specific hitter might have. Do you yeah. talk also about that yeah. to your players? Yeah, no, we talk a lot about as you know the front court. I, I like the stuff you're talking about. You covered that, like just seeing the hitter, seeing the angles, making sure we we get our eyes on them and understand the information. But in the back court, we're talking about, hey, look, here's the line of approach, and then here's the scene that's created. And if there's going to be space, like you have to see the whole picture that's in front of you. If the middle's a little bit late, there's going to be a seam. Do you need to step up on this? And or if it's a higher set and you see it's being closed, can I back up and put myself in a position to go chase that high flat shot? And then just letting them have the freedom inside. Like the same thing as I was talking about with, with Morgan, like what you see, like react to what you see and then put yourself in the right position. And I think the key on that is like when they make a mistake, like everything, and I keep coming back to this, but the key is when they make a mistake is to like not yell at them, but go, what did you see? How, yeah. like, why, why did you make that decision? And then, and then talk about it a little bit and understand. So like, I, I really, my goal and kind of, I felt that way a little bit. I didn't have to say much on the court when it was going on. Like we had our plan, we made adjustments certainly in, in our matches because they adjusted and we talked about those, but I want them to understand the game at a level where we don't have to be yelling at them every second about position mm -hmm. and give them some freedom inside of our system. I trust them because they put the time in, but I think you, they have to trust that it's going to be okay. And that's part of that is how we respond to when they fail, make mistakes. Cause they do a lot, especially when they're early on. But I agree. That was a thing that we talked about in 17, when we lost, we didn't defend and we didn't defend mm -hmm. the, the stuff way you're talking about the way that we needed to. And I was a little bit frustrated that year talking about that amongst the group. It took us yeah. losing. It took us like, they never really, they never really got it. I think because they won the year before and we were winning, you know, we were, we were, mm -hmm. we were, we were playing well, but not at the level I thought we could get and uh, where I thought we could get to. And, uh, in in eighteen, no, the the spring of eighteen, when we got together, we we talked about being more defensive minded, and that has carried over now. I think our team is extremely defensive minded. I mean, I actually I, I would say that's one of our greatest strengths is our defensive mind. We had a high efficiency, but we really shut teams down. I mean, you look at the numbers of teams that hit against us compared to their season numbers, and we did a really nice job defensively against literally everyone this last year, I thought. so. Yeah, and that's the thing that um, we can see the effect that your blockers and defenders have on the opponent hitting percentage, and that's what I care more than just the blocking numbers or number of digs. So, you know, the hitting percentage against you so it tends to be lower than the norm, even with great players around the nation. But I, I want to present one last thing about defensively here, and I want you to see number 12, who is – the right side for Stanford, again, continues to be the one that in the far side of the camera. I want you to either, I want you to see how she's right now in the bunch. She's fronting the gap. Once she understands that the, she has no one to front, watch her load and get ready for her number one responsibility. I want you to watch that right step and how her shoulders are turning to the palm, basically. 
Okay, so she's already paying more attention than anything to her main responsibility. And she did not touch the ball, but she 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 created a great block. And you know, and how, how my friend Javier Gaspar says, you could be a great blocker without touching the ball. That's a great mark right there, great set of filtering the ball to the best defender. So watch and everything started before the top before the jump. Watch that load. And watch her eye sequence, ball, 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 ball. And right at the end, then she's putting her eyes on the hitter. So for me, like small things like that, coach, you know, tells me right away why you became the number one team in the nation. Yes, talent was important, but what you did with that talent, what you continue to do, for me, is the impressive part about it, coach. Thanks. Yeah. Well, they, those players bought in, they worked really hard and they, they were very talented and they were a great blocking team. But what I like about, I mean, Fitz had to move from Fitz Morris is the player that you had right there from middle to right, which is, I think for her, it was a little bit of a relief, but uh, it took her a while to figure out. But I think they all, I mean, like I said, even in the last, last week of training, they're trying to get better. They're not going through the motion. They never went through the motions. They all try to get better all the time. And, um, it was it was a fun group to coach, and I'm looking forward to my next group because, I, actually, my spring I think was one of my favorites. I've had a been around because they're all these young they're all these young athletes and incredible talent, but have a lot to learn. And they're they were incredibly open to learning and just dying to like they were trying to pull as much knowledge as they could out of us. The bummer is that we had five practices and it's all it's all over. <laughs> wow. So I assume we'll we'll jump back into it as we get as we. Uh, Come back in the fall, hopefully. Knock on wood. Kevin, you seem like a bully junkie. You know, you seem like you're you are always talking about learning. You know, you have mentioned the word learning so much in this conversation, and I love that type of quality. For those coaches out there, why is someone that has won championships like you? You're already the you already have the number one team in the nation. Why you need to continue to keep learning? You know, if you're ready, if you're ready at the top of the mountain, can you talk to us about that? Well, I mean, the game's changing and evolving, and I, I, um, and I, I think I owe it to my athletes to try to be better all the time. You know, I, I think, um, and try to try to stay ahead of it. I, I feel I feel a great responsibility to my athletes to make sure that I'm providing the best experience that I can for them, and to, and to be as uh, on top of the things that are um, happening in the international space, uh, especially. You know, I, I always I watch this as much men's international volleyball as I do women's because I feel like everything's moving that direction. You know, I think the women's international looks probably similar to men's 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, as far as the tempo and the way that they play. And I watch men's international volleyball now, and I love some of the things that are happening. Uh, you know, I don't know that we're ever going to serve at the level that the, uh, the men's teams serve at with the jump top spin. I don't know if we have enough arms to do that, but the way the men are playing out of system, the way they're playing tight, the open hand, the off speed, the jamming, the wiping, all that stuff. That's stuff that we're trying to add in our gym. And what I like about that is, you know, for me, I'm like, it's a new way to look at the game. It's a new, it's, it's a, it's something new I can bring to my, my athletes to keep it fresh, keep it moving. But also like, I think it's important because that's they're scoring and they're more efficient and the game's moving that direction. And I need to understand why it's happening and then see if it's something I can implement. So I, I just think I'm wired that way to, to try to, I think I, a little bit's responsibility, a lot of it's responsibility probably. A lot of it's to my athletes, a lot, but a lot of it's curiosity just because I, I'm a, I, I like to learn about history. I mean, when I, things I'm reading, I'm reading about history and things like that, you know, I just, or um, I don't know, I just, I'm constantly trying to learn more myself, but I, I think for volleyball, I just was always wired on trying to learn more and more as I'm moving forward. So I don't know. It's a hard thing for me to answer. To be what type of pressure do you have? In the beginning, when you got into that program, you were yeah. already solving a Hall of Fame coach, um, yeah. you know, uh, in a really, really, really good team. Um, you know, how do you feel like? It, do you do you ever think about it? You know, when you when you got the job, or you know, talk to us a little bit about that process. Yeah, I I certainly I think I could have looked at it as a lot of pressure to have these great athletes and have this opportunity. I will say, like. Um, I'll just back up a second from Stanford. When I was at Illinois, the minute we hit the final, like we had a final NCAA championship final, everyone assumed we should do that every year after that. And so the, the expectations of that program were kind of similar to Stanford, even though Stanford's won nine championships now. You know, they've won the most championships in 
in uh, in the history of um, NCAA volleyball, collegiate volleyball. Um, but Illinois made one final, and everyone had that expectation. And um, it was hard to recruit. It wasn't the same place to recruit. It's a great school. I love that place. I I mean, we my my kids would still call that home. I I love Illinois. I love the opportunities I had there. But Stanford had a different level of athlete than. And we'll, it's an easier place to recruit to. And it's, we have some really talented athletes. It's just the reality of um, what the schools have to offer a little bit. You know, as far as academically, this is an incredible place and it's an incredible athletic history. Um, do I think Illinois can win a championship? Yes, but it's going to be a little bit easier here. So coming into this place, the expectations were the same, I guess. Like I, the expectations are to win or to be in the Final Four every year. So that wasn't new for me. And what I learned is like um, – I have to put those expectations aside and just do the best job that I can with the group and just like whatever job I can, like have to create my own level of success, not external level, of, like what success is to everyone else. I know um, 17, I think was a failure in a lot of people's eyes because they, we didn't win the championship. Hmm. That's not why it was a failure in my eyes. It was a failure in my eyes because we weren't the, we didn't reach come as close to the, our potential as I thought we could. I thought we weren't, we didn't like defensively, we didn't ever bought in. We weren't like, those are the problems that I saw as we got into that. The next year was in 17, we weren't defensive minded. We were trying to rely on our offense. We absolutely tried to rely on Plummer too much. And, and um, it just was, I was frustrated with the group and I never got that group to go the direction I wanted to, but it wasn't about winning and losing the championship. It was about the fact that we weren't performing at the highest level. The next year I thought we got, we, we, with what time limit we had, we made the progress we needed to, and we were committed. And I mean, the reality is we won the championship. So everyone looks at that as success, but we were one point, it was a one point difference between us and Nebraska. So like whether or not we won that championship, if it was, if it was swish, if it was reversed, like overall, if you look at the score, it was one point, one point. That's not, wow. that's so small. And, the, and it felt that way in that match and people that watched it. I mean, we pulled away at the end, but it was close, but I would have looked at that, that season as success because I thought we came close to maximizing our potential. And then this year I thought, we started slow early and everyone, I mean, the, the, if I listened to people outside, it was, it was a, hey, uh, they shouldn't lose a set all year and all this crap, you know? And it's like, no, we're going to, I'm playing the toughest schedule in the country. Maybe we're going to lose. And I want to lose matches because we want to grow. We want to fail. Like I want to put us in some hard situations in hard environments like Nebraska, Nebraska, when it's one versus two or whatever place was crazy. It was awesome. And I, we ended up winning that one, but we lost other ones, you know? And I, I was okay with that. I just wanted to meet our potential at the end of the year. And I thought we did. I don't, I thought we were, we weren't done. We weren't a complete product, but we, with the time limits that we had and the injuries and all that stuff that we got as close to reaching our potential as we could within the constraints that we had. And that's how I judge success. So if, when I look at the world that way, like where does pressure come from? I feel pressure to do that. I feel mm -hmm. I'm stressed out to do that. That's why I continue to watch video and try to push and all that, but I don't feel it from the external factors. I don't, if you if you were, if you if you think about that and other people's expectations, uh, you're gonna I mean, go crazy. You're gonna go crazy. Is there is there a decision that you have made in a match, Kevin, that you, it still haunts you? You know, is there is there anything that you look back and you say, I got on the way of being better? Yeah, I, I a lots of times, especially <laughs> especially early. I I think every NCAA tournament. Well, not every, but most NCAA tournaments um, early on in my career, like I made it bigger than I needed to. I made it like a big deal. I, um, in 11, 2011, I was, I was, I saw it as an opportunity for the program to really like take a jump. You know, like we had a great team and the year before we probably, we were um, the number three team in the country. We had just beaten uh, Texas in three, who was number two. And uh, or no, we were five. We played Texas, but we ended up being three. They were number two in the country. We beat them three zero. I had a really good team. I had Barch and Ward and um, uh, Laura Bruler on the outside, and those three first team All American out pin players. And over their time, they were they were, but they were great. And I felt like I had a team that could do it. And then Laura Bruler tore her ACL. Um, we were, I think we were, we had, we were undefeated at that time. We had one loss at that time, and she tore ACL, and our season kind of sidetracked because we just didn't have the depth um the next year the year coming back i felt all this pressure first to keep them healthy and get through it and, and uh but also most importantly like we have to make this is my maybe my last chance at a run for a while and so that pressure that i 
either put on myself or I don't know, probably it was more external then. Um, I definitely put on the players. And now we get in a mm. tournament. Now we get in a tournament. And the things I'm talking about are the opposite of, of we never talk about winning ever. We don't talk about winning. The, we talk. We set the goal of winning the championship. It's almost assumed, right? And then we just get to work. And we don't even bring it up. Never again. And um, we just – and in the tournament, all I talk about is being loose and relaxed and playing our game and having a good time. And I, I'm really loose and relaxed. And I do everything I can to stay out of the way. I teach in the practice and in the matches. I just try to stay out of the way. Because all through, all through probably 10, 11, and 12, and 13, maybe even more – I got in the way of my athletes and I just um, just was a lesson that I had to learn. Mm. How many, how many drills you use around, around what during a season? Like what's your, you know, what's, what's your number? I would say that a lot of our drills, um, like we, we, you know, we got serve and pass and we got some kind of defensive drill and then we got some play drill and maybe we break up some small group tutoring stuff. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what our practice is. Right. And then maybe some games to start, like some, two versus two, some three versus three. We have a, a series of games that we'll do there. Um, that's kind of what our practice is. So, but we score them different or we add different wrinkles or we add different opportunities to learn different things or we look at a different combination while we're working on things. So, um, yeah, they're, they're kind of similar. You know, it's a, a lot of live serve, some kind of forced transition play, whether that's in system or out of system, mostly out of system. But we might emphasize something like, hey, if you tool down the line, you get two points on an out-of-system mm. ball. Or if you get to the quick on a, on a serve receive ball, that's worth two points. Or you have to do earn this, you know, get this percentage of points. Or, you know, just different things to try to change, mess with the scoring to try to use that as a, another tool to teach. Hmm. And within that, um, did it does it change when you're in the spring, Coach? Do you, do you do more block training during the spring or do you stay within more randomness than anything else? Well, we do a lot of small group stuff. so we. It's we, but we try to make that as random as fast as we can, as close to you know. I mean, so like if we have an individual, a couple individuals in there passing, we might start off with working through some of the keys on a bowl, but we're going to get to a live serve pretty quick and work on stuff. So we try to, we try to maybe do a little bit of block just to teach the basics, like to get an introduction, give them a feel, and then move to move to random as much as we can. And as fast as we can, we're going to get two passers out there. If we have only two passers, we're going to get two out there versus a live serve as much as we can, you know, as fast as we can. Coach, um, I want to ask you really quick about the late, legendary assistant coach, Corlett. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about her and what made her so special for your program for such a long time? And I just would like to maybe honor one of the most, uh, you know, best known assistant coaches around the nation. And, and why, why was she so special for Stanford University? Yeah, well, Stanford is a very unique place to recruit to. So for those that aren't, uh, I don't know who, if they know our university very well that are you know international coaches, but we're one of the top universities academically in the, in the country. And in order to get in here, you have to really earn it. We don't get to get athletes in that uh, we get a little bit of leeway, like very, very small. But <laughs> these, our, our student athletes are 4.0s and getting 1400 on the SAT or if not higher, you know, they're, they're great students. And that process of recruiting is very stressful for um, the athletes coming in because when I was all these Illinois, as an example, when, if I like the freshman or sophomore and we communicate with them, we could offer them, they could accept. At Stanford, we're not allowed to offer an athlete until they get into school. Wow. So, so what we are basically doing is recruiting athletes to wait while all the other schools are dropping them, are recruiting them to wait. And Denise was really good at understanding what it took to get into the university. She, well, first off, she was an incredible judge of talent. She was great at evaluating talent. She, she, um, she knew what a great athlete looked like. She could see the potential in athletes. She had a really good eye for talent. And then she was, uh, she knew how to get it with the process to get in better than anyone maybe on campus besides the people making those decisions. And then, uh, She was great with communicating with the, the parents, especially, and the athletes, but especially the parents about what this process is. Because really the people that – the athletes are stressed out, but the people that really stress out are the moms and the dads. Because <laughs> they're seeing the, – the kids have committed to it, right? If they're going to come, they're committed to it, and they're in charge. They're in control. But the moms and the dads are watching their kid 
you know, lose these other opportunities to other top five programs potentially and hope with the hope that their daughter will do well enough in school and well enough in their tests so they can get into school. And mm -hmm. so Denise was really good about helping her manage that. And, and, you know, and then she understood volleyball. She's, she won nine national championships. Wow. So, I mean, she's part of all nine of them here. And, um, she knew what high level volleyball was and she had a good eye for in scouting and she had a good eye for what it took to, to win matches. And she was a great resource for us. And, and certainly for me, she, um, provided a lot of context and history of what this place is and, um, made me better, you know, in the time that I was able to work with her, no doubt. Coach, I want to show you something really quick. Your new assistant coach, Alicia Glass, kept, yeah. me, kept me from winning a pro league championship <laughs> in 2013. But I want you to remind her that. I that will. That she was a monster. She was a beast um, playing against her in Maya West. You know, I was in Pinking, Corozal. Um, can you tell me what she brings to the table now? Well, first off, she prevented me from winning three Big Ten championships <laughs> or maybe four because we finished second to her team all, oh. all the years that she was there. But she, uh, what does she bring? Well, first off, um, she is a remarkable coach and all this stuff we're talking about like when we start talking about coaching philosophy and like what 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 actually like growth mindset is and like teaching and how to treat the athletes like we were in lockstep like we saw it the same and that was exciting to me because i knew what she would she could bring like she brings credibility to our athletes certainly you know here's someone that's playing the olympics here's mm -hmm. someone that's won national championships as a player and for me you know just in the in the immediate year working with jenna you know she Alicia won three national championships. Jenna was trying to win three national championships. And the pressure to repeat is – repeating is hard. Like, repeating is really tough. And uh, we learned that lesson in 17, and we weren't going to make the same mistake in, in 19, or we're going to do everything we could to make sure that we weren't going to make the same mistake. And she could give um, – I don't know, help help Jenna kind of navigate what that is and to be the leader of that group and do all that. So she's been great. But she's – I mean, that, that was immediate. What really stood out to me was just she is a great teacher – And she is extremely patient with the athletes in the right way, holds them accountable. I mean, I think she has a really, really bright future as a coach. As good as a player she is, honestly, I think she could be a better coach than she was a player. She's really, really special. Coach, when you are in the convention center um, and you're looking at a player, aside from position specific, what are things that are the most important intangibles for you? Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's – yeah, I think the, the talent – like whether you like them as a talent, like talent, like, you know, you walk into, mm -hmm. you walk into any court, you watch a court, you know, who the best players are. <laughs> that stuff's easy to me. I want to see like, do they work hard? Do they compete hard? What's their motor like in the gym? Are they a good teammate? You know, are they like, I guess I, if I had to ask myself the questions I'd, I'd ask, like when I'm watching this player, do I want to coach them? Would <laughs> I want to play with them? Would I want to be their teammate? You know, like what I want to be in that. And then um, do I think that they, uh, have that mindset where they want to grow and be better. You know, do they, do they think of themselves as like being, and a lot of that comes later after the gym where you start to talk to them and you be, you're around them. But mostly like, do I want to coach them and do I want to be their teammate? And like, what's their attitude like? What are they, what's their motor like? How hard do they play? Like all that kind of stuff. And I don't mind if they got a little edge. I like the ones with a little bit of edge. Obviously I was that kind of player and we certainly had some edge in our gym. Um, that doesn't bother me, but you, you got to make sure it's respect. It's coming out of respect and it's respectful. Um, and then one of the last questions that I have is um, seeing speed and power have become, you know, such a, a big emphasis in modern volleyball. Um, has your recruiting changed in terms of the type of players that you get in your teams compared to, let's say, 2011? Uh, no, I think we've always wanted the most the biggest, most physical, well-rounded athletes that we, we could always get. I think there's more of those athletes and they're getting bigger and more physical now. Than they were, but we were always trying to get the biggest, most physical athletes that we could and that could play at the highest level. The one thing I would challenge you on, though, is when I watch high-level men's volleyball, I think there's speed and power on the serving, and there's they're, they're physical and they're playing, but um, the way that they're using it is very different where it's a lot of off-speed stuff, a lot of jams, yes. a lot of tips, a lot of wipes. I think, you know, like one of the things I take from the men's game is that there's other ways to score. It's like you can attack space in different ways and you can play with depths in a different way. And you, whether that's open hand, whether that's roll shot, but I, you know, I was watching um, Juan Terena play. Mm -hmm. I, I think I said that right. I told you I'm terrible you with did. Spanish. But that's my, that's, okay, good. 
<laughs> uh, I just was watching him in you know World Cup match, and I just charting him and looking at him, and I think seventy percent of his swings were out of system on a high ball, where he's one of the most physical, gifted, gifted athletes in the world. Yeah, and that's that's his choice, and so I think yeah, you he can go with a big rip, you know, and that's what keeps everyone back. But how they use that is different, and I think that's that's the part that we're trying to bring to our game that's different. I mean, if you watch Plummer, you mm -hmm. watch the high ball. She jammed and she tipped and she wiped and she did a lot of stuff that wasn't just go club it. And she had one of the biggest arms in NCAA volleyball. And um, I was, uh, you know, that's the things that I was happy to see her do because it just made her even more difficult to defend. 15 subs, NCAA, that's a question that I get a lot, you know, when I talk in other places with international level volleyball. Yeah. Um, they wonder... How is it translating into national team and, you know, in Team USA being so good consistently when there's so much specialization in early ages in, in USA, you know, per se? Do you feel that those 15 subs contribute to specialization, coach, or how do you see the concept going? No, I think it hurts our national team. I, even though we've had a lot of success, I think Karch has a tough job. I, I've been in that. You know, we were, I was with Toshi, Toshi from 01 to 04. Mm -hmm. And we had medals that came in that had never served before in their lives, you know? <laughs> and so like just stuff like that, it's, I think it hurts the game. They have to teach, they have to teach a lot, which is one of the strengths that I think USA volleyball has had for a long time. You know, they, they've been great teachers and um, that, you know, going back to Marv Dumphy, going back to, you know, Terry Laskevich, like those teams that got together uh, that they put together that and Doug Beal early on and Doug Beal late, like they had to teach and uh, the players didn't come in just ready to play. They really had to help them develop. And I think we're making it harder on the national team. I think it's, uh, you know, the, if you ask our administrators, and I agree with this at some level, our job is not to create national team players. Our job is to win championships and to offer a great experience to our student athletes and make them better people and help them, not make them, help them become better people and grow. And um, so having more subs for them is about participation. That means you're going to get more athletes on the floor and, And that's the, that's why that exists. Uh, and so, you know, people get upset about it. But if you understand the why, like we talked about from the beginning, then you, you then you just kind of embrace it and be like, okay, this is this is why this exists. This is a different model. This is not international volleyball. And a lot of administrators, not a lot. Everyone wants to win and be competitive. But if you offer a great experience to your student athletes, you're you're doing about 75% of your job. The other 25% is to is to win. You know, I look at it that way. And Those go hand in hand. If they're if you have great people, they're usually better. Your team's better, and you you have a more ch a better chance for success. But I would talk. You know, most administrators would say like, "Hey, first and foremost, take care of your athletes, and and give them a great experience, and and um, and then win. And if we can offer more participation opportunities for those athletes, then that's that fits that model. So um, I think that's it's hurting the national team, but I don't see that ever changing. I think it's I think it's a it's something that. Um, teams are recruiting to now with the six twos and all that stuff. But also, I don't think that the administrators want less players on the floor. It, it creates less, more unhappy players. And mm -hmm. so we just are a totally different model and have a totally different, um, yeah, just a different model. Things we're looking for out of this, out of this experience. Coach, how do you want your players to remember you when they leave your program? What's your goal? Uh, I just want them to feel like I just helped them be the best version of themselves that they could. And that they, that I, they never felt judged, and that um, I was a positive, had a positive impact on their growth as people. That's it. I, you know, I, I think the the volleyball stuff goes away pretty quick. You know, like even like when I talk to Michelle Barch now, we talk mm -hmm. volleyball very little. It's a lot more about life and families and future. You know, and here's a player that I've stayed in touch with since, you know, I've known since she was in 2006. You know, and since she was a kid, and that I've stayed in touch with pretty regularly since till now, like, you know, just a couple of weeks, like last week, I think was the last time I was texting with her, but we don't talk about the, what I did volleyball wise. We talk more about like life and the future and maybe I'm, I'm a resource in other ways for moving forward. And that's way more important to me than volleyball. Volleyball goes away pretty quick. Last question. When this crisis ends and you have some time, where are you planning to take your family for vacation? What's your like destination that you dream about? Uh, I mean, the destination, I, well, first, when this thing ends, I'm just excited to get in the gym, to be honest, yeah. when there's no vacation. But when the season's over, whenever that is, 
Uh, my wife really loves Maui, so it doesn't really matter what I want. We'll probably try to get to Maui for a week and hang out there. So you, you, I don't know, you learned that Manolo. When you, it doesn't matter what my dream is. It's what <laughs> the dream of my wife is, and that's where we go. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, probably, we'll probably go to Maui or something like that here and uh, lay on the beach, and she wants me to relax and just chill out, and that's what we'll do. That's awesome. Hey, yeah. it has been a great pleasure talking to you today, Kevin. Um, you know, people in Illinois, in the state of Illinois, you know, have so much respect for you around the nation as well. But you have given so much to the communities here. Um, you know, for the ones that don't know, Eastern Illinois, where I work at, it's like 40 minutes away from where Kevin Hamley uh, coached for a while and actually helped continue to build that program into the powerhouse that it is today as well. So. Uh, with that said, I just want to thank you for the opportunity and honor of talking to you today. And it's been a great learning opportunity for me and hopefully for the people out there watching and listening. And uh, we just wish you the best. Continue to do the great things that you're doing at Stanford University. And uh, thank you for being a master learner and example for all of us to follow. Thank you for doing this. This is incredible what you're doing with all these coaches. And I love that all these coaches are coming on with you and you do a great job. So for me to be this, I'm humbled that you would ask me to be a part of these great coaches. So thank you for letting me be a part of this. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kevin. And thank you. Uh, everyone out there, take care. Tomorrow we're going to have you, uh, Giuseppe Benchi, which is the creator of Bali Metrics. And then Monday we're going to have Trevor Regan, which actually is going to talk to us about model learning and developing a growth mindset in the game. So I see everyone tomorrow at the same time. Thanks for watching.